Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante, and this is theCUBE. We're here live at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, we're exploring cyberspace and the gaps in cyberspace governance and international relations. We're here at the ECIR workshop, which is uh, hosted by MIT. Erin Fitzgerald is here. She is a program director at the Minerva Research In Initiative, which is the sponsor of this event. And also Michael Sumeyer is here. He's a senior policy advisor for the Office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Defense for Cyber Policy. Folks, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So Aaron, let's start with you. First of all, thank you for sponsoring this event and thanks for having us here. We're really excited to be able to, be able to come to events like this and what we say, extract the signal from the noise and share with our audience some of the developments that are going on. But why don't you talk about your organization and, and your role and we'll get into some of your research and the relationship between you and the DOD. Sure, no, I'd be happy to. Yeah. So, um, so as you mentioned, I direct the Minerva Research Initiative. This is actually a DOD uh, sponsored program. It was actually uh, in 2008, then former Secretary of uh, Defense Gates started this program. So it's pretty unusual to have a Secretary of Defense starting a research program. But the idea of this research program is in general having a, building a fundamental understanding of what are the social and cultural forces that shape regions of strategic interest. So what is it that causes um, social and human behavior and motivations to happen? And Minerva covers everything from looking at sort of terrorism, terrorist ideologies, to looking at uh, energy and environmental security, to looking at economic security, all the way over to cyber, um, sort of the human side of cyber. And the Minerva program um, has been funding the explorations in cyber international relations project for the last uh, uh, almost five years and uh, are happy to be sponsoring this project. Today. So talk, talk a little bit more about um, the, the team that does the research, how you go about you know, gathering the information. Sure, well so Minerva uh, funds currently about 40 active university-led projects and they run everywhere from single investigator projects to large team projects, a um, million dollars or so a year, which for social science, you can you can get a lot of mileage out of that type of investment, but um, there's uh, Minerva is unique in uh, in as a basic research program because not only is it very focused on fundamental understanding building and research, but it's it actually started as a, a policy initiative at DoD. So I work closely with colleagues like Michael, um, who are part of OSD policy to make sure when we're selecting the projects that not only are they um, you know, high in scientific merit, but also in relevance, also in sort of the impacts that may come from the project, um, et cetera. So what I do in my role um, is everything from um, managing all the research projects that we have to trying to understand what are the new research topics that we should invest in. So should we have more projects looking at cyber international relations? What about governance? What about security? Or is there another component of, of uh, sort of cyber relations or other sort of non-conventional uh, deterrence theory that we might want to invest in more? Um, helping to select the projects. And I work with, uh, with different, um, the Office of Naval Research and the Army and the Air Force to help choose what has the best scientific merit, and I work with policy um, to make sure that we're asking the right questions and selecting the projects that are going to be the most important. Um, so I manage the projects, and then I try to do a lot of outreach to make sure that as the teams develop the insights that come out of this investment with these you know, brilliant researchers, that they're not just doing this in a vacuum, but that we're connecting it to the people who can benefit from the answers to these questions. So, so part of your job is connecting the dots across the research initiatives where it's relevant. Right. And then connecting it to, to app applying it, actually. Right, yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. So, um, right, making sure that uh, we have an ongoing uh, relationship and engagement between the researchers and the policy of the community, the intelligence community, other parts of the government who are involved in national security issues. So. Uh, how, roughly how many projects do you run per annum? I mean, if that's the right metric. Right, so most of the projects are three to five year projects. Um, we start about eight or nine new projects a year, generally. Um, and that depends, of course, on uh, the budget cycle and, and Congress and everything else. But 
but given the structure we have, uh, the portfolio, we try to have a good balance between topics. Um, so I mentioned we have some projects that are in the cyber realm, but we have a number of projects that are more looking at uh, belief formation and propagation through a network, for example, or looking at uh, different types of governance structure or more broadly just the changing role of the state in a globalizing world. So, so um, we have projects across that gamut and we try to have a combination of large projects, small projects, more qualitative projects and quantitative projects, and um, in general, some projects that might pan out and be useful immediately and others that might have 10-year uh, long-term benefits. So, Mike, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about we're talking off camera about the, the missions uh, of, of the department. I wonder if you could talk about that and then maybe Aaron can maybe tie into it some of the research has, how some of the research has supported those, those missions. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. And uh, you were able to capture the title that uh, I currently have in the Cyber Policy Office very well. And so as background, it's a good first rule of Washington to always remember that the longer the title, the least important the guy. <laughs> so my apologies, you are stuck with me. <laughs> but it, at least I'm able to talk a little bit about what our office does and the overarching missions of the American Department of Defense when it comes to cyber policy. We're part of the office of the Secretary of Defense, an institution within the Department of Defense that was created in 1947 as part of a way to ensure civilian oversight, systematic civilian oversight of the military. The historians in the audience will remember that World War II was usually was fought essentially with the Army, the War Department, doing one set of actions, the Navy Department doing another set of actions, and after the war there was a decision to unify. So we are part of the civilian organization that tries to unify military policy. Specifically, as someone employed in the Cyber Policy Office, we spend a lot of time thinking about civilian oversight of the military with regard to cyber policy. So that's the background on our part of the organization. Aaron is a great colleague in the acquisition technology logistics side of Office of the Secretary of Defense and doing the work that she does, as she just told you about. In the policy side of thinking about cyber and, and how the military plays, it's taken the department a little while, but I think we're able to articulate three primary missions at this point. The Defense Department is an operational organization, and so we think in terms of missions. And these missions were articulated uh, really by uh, our former Deputy Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, at a speech not too long ago in Aspen. And there he spoke about a mission to defend Defense Department networks. He spoke about a mission to ensure that cyber capabilities are available to support contingencies. And he spoke about a mission to make sure that the department can defend the nation. And that's a sort of proper noun, defend the nation in quotes, defend the nation in the event of a very serious cyber attack coming against the United States. A word on each of those very briefly, and then we'll, we'll go back. Uh, to defend DOD networks, you'll find people tend to start with that mission first because if DOD's networks are problematic and compromised, it's very difficult to do the other two. Not impossible, but it's very important to begin with defending our own DOD networks. The second, in terms of contingencies, just like any standard uh, military operation, uh, you want to make sure you've got the full range of options available to the senior most decision makers uh, when they need to be able to use them. And third, for Defend the Nation, this is really an example of terrific whole of government interagency support across the U.S. government to make sure that all your government is working together to make sure that the nation is secure from cyber attack. It's not, don't think of it as your military out in front doing everything all the time for everyone. Think of it more as we're making sure we're working with the Department of Homeland Security, we're working with the FBI, we're working with justice in general to make sure that the nation is secure from a cyber attack. So we heard this morning actually, you know, sort of the, the premises, we don't really want to fork the internet, we don't have a China internet, the German internet, and the US internet, et cetera, but maybe, maybe different militaries will have, you know, their own networks, so that kind of makes sense. Do you, have you done research on that? And and maybe you can share some of the findings with us? Sure, well, maybe not research directly in that area, but certainly looking at the cultural components of internet governance and cyber governance, and governance really in general, what are the 
the norms of, you know, what is the normative behavior of sharing information, of privacy, of um, being able to track information sources. So um, by kind of looking across the board at different cultures um, and trying to distill out where are compromises possible, where are they not possible. Um, this is some of the, the investigations that we have ongoing right now. Um, most of the Minerva research is really looking to inform strategy rather than um, tactics or, or me more immediate policy. So it's meant to try to look at big picture questions that, that Michael's boss and those with the shorter and shorter titles um, can, can help to make their uh, strategic plans based on. But um, in terms of looking at uh, specific countries and um, their normative effects, we've heard a lot today about the idea that we, that really the government or that the internet, um, we want to have a unified internet, but the idea of having a centralized, single party led internet is also not feasible and in fact may lose legitimacy in the eyes of many of the other parties as we have sort of strengthening parties in other ways. So that, that again leads to a non-cyber question, but something else that my program might look at of, you know, how does power projection work for states? How do states sort of uh, show themselves to be a growing power versus, um, you know, someone who's willing to let someone else take the lead? And those types of lessons can also help inform uh, decisions that we might make for cyber policy uh, at DOD and, and the other parts of the, the government and national security agencies. So, I mean, from a purely U.S. perspective, you know, having this sort of, whether perceived or real, and I think part of it is real, this U.S. controlled internet, not necessarily such a bad thing for the U.S. Mm -hmm. military. So you've got to project forward mm -hmm. what the impacts of sort of a more multi-stakeholder adjudicated internet would right. mean from a from a, a, a defense standpoint what, what can you share with us as you as you look forward um, in terms of you know what research is, is indicating well I think that the discussions that we've had today first of all workshops like this are not only to bring out uh, some of the results from research but it's really to help inform what are the questions that the researchers should continue mm -hmm. looking at so I think Today we've brought up a lot of questions that um, hopefully the researchers at MIT and Harvard and other, other researchers in this area might look at in terms of, again, um, what is in the U.S. best interest. You know, the, the immediate uh, gut reaction might be the more we control, the more it is in our interest. But again, there's that question of the loss of legitimacy that may, uh, may move parties to look at entirely different governance structures other than those that we control, which may in the long run uh, potentially weaken our position or not. So how can we look at sort of the, the large system of systems um, in international relations, both cyber and, and more broadly? Um, and I think those are questions that we'll definitely be looking more at now. But in terms of trying to identify what are the levers that um, that will define a successful U.S. program and a program where U.S. can um, help to control the outputs in the future. Um, understanding what is connected to what will help us achieve those goals. Well, in a way, it's it's, it's somewhat easy for the department because you could be myopic. I mean, you've you stated the three missions pretty clear. Um, you know, economic gain for corporations is not one of the missions. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that, even though that's tugging on a lot of things, Aaron, that you have to, to, right. to, to, to research. So, okay, so what are some of the other burning questions that, that you want to see you know, addressed? By the specific yeah. group or, yeah. or more broadly? So this group, as I mentioned, have been funded for almost five years. So they're coming sort of to the end of the investment that they have. And in the meantime, this is a project that, um, I'm not sure if you've discussed it, it's you know, we're at MIT today, but it's a project that's um, multidisciplinary. So it's MIT's political science um, group, MIT's uh, business school, the Sloan School, MIT's CSAIL, some of the computer science, and also at Harvard Kennedy School, their Belfer Center, um, looking specifically, especially at science and technology policy. So this is you know, four very different perspectives, all on specific um, issues. So. Um, the Belfer Center people have been looking specifically at policy issues and how to distill out lessons from 
from specific cases in history uh, so that we can generate uh, inputs. Um, the Sloan School people and the computer scientists are actually building models based on data that we have based on reported cyber attacks in different areas, um, based on sort of the growth of user bases in different countries to try to better model and understand whether or not um, we have the right parameter set or the right, um, the right uh, vision of what really is connected to what in terms of building a more secure uh, network and enterprise. So I think as those groups move forward towards converging, um, I know there's a lot of people uh, in Michael's group and others who will be very excited to see sort of the final conclusions of this five-year project. Excellent. So, um, so what's next? What's next for you? Um, I wonder if you could share with us sort of, um, you know, what you see. Mm -hmm. You know, looking forward, bring out your crystal ball a little <laughs> bit. But you, right. know, you work in you work in five-year stints, so you've got to have Absolutely. a long horizon. So, so bring out the telescope. What, uh, what, sure. what do you see? Down the road? Well, it's and that's a tricky part of basic research in general. If we're only looking at the problems, you know, if we only focus right now on cyber governance issues, uh, mediating between the U.S. and China, in five years that may not be what's important, and it may be Brazil that's a larger player, and maybe if we weren't careful, the questions won't generalize to help us inform those those larger questions. So. So I think definitely having a good balance between specificity and generalizability in our investments will help us to have sort of the, the most broad and robust set of uh, insights that might come out. But in the, in the cyber realm, um, cyber's, you know, it's brought, been brought up several times today, cyber is really one part of a larger system and is less and less of a standalone system now. So the idea of cross-domain deterrence is something that the department has talked very much about, so this is looking at an increasingly multipolar world where um, you have more and more uh, mechanisms of incentivizing and uh, deterring specific types of behavior. You know, so no longer do we have sort of uh, kinetic or you know warfare types of levers and economic levers. We also have cyber, um, both cyber controls and cyber attacks. We have. You know what is the space realm going to include, and when we have multi, you know, more and more players who have real strength in the world, and we're not sure, you know, if an economic attack happens, you know, should we increase, you know, our cyber attacks by a certain amount, or at what point do we start to escalate out of control or have sort of equitable, you know, uh, proportional responses across different uh, domains? So. I think that's one of the largest questions we have going forward in the cyber realm and beyond. Just how do how do these uh, outputs really um, compare to each other, and how can we have a better understanding of the escalatory dynamics that can help us uh, keep the nation safe and secure and in control? Cool. A lot of uh, a lot of interesting challenges you have ahead. So no shortage of things to research. Right. Cool job. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, Aaron, thanks very much for coming on, Michael. You too. Appreciate it. And and, uh, and good luck going forward. Thank you Thank very you. much. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back. We're live at MIT's Media Lab. This is theCUBE. Right back.